I'm Laura Bonnell, and this is the Living with Cystic Fibrosis podcast coming to you from Detroit. Please subscribe and even rate and comment on our podcasts when it moves you. I learn something new with every podcast, and I'm always inspired by the people that are showcased here. We don't give medical advice. You need to connect with your doctor for that. I hope that this Living with Cystic Fibrosis podcast educates you and sparks some volunteering or advocacy. The CF community needs people like you. Thanks to our sponsor, Beatrice, for their support. We head over to Canada for this podcast, and we are joined by our favorite Canadian advocate and my friend, Beth Vanstone. Beth has two daughters, Maddie and Jesse, and Maddie has CF. And to remind you, Beth has been advocating for medications like Trikafta in Canada, and she's also been advocating for a rare disease group. She advocates tirelessly there, and we are all very grateful. Today, Beth and I will be talking to Taraj Manjadi. He is 32 years old. He is one of many CF patients hurt by a failure in healthcare policy in Canada. In Canada, you may be surprised to learn, does not have a rare disease strategy. Taraj got a Bachelor's of Commerce in Finance and Real Estate from the University of British Columbia. He also has a graduate degree in real estate investment management. And he does a lot of volunteer work. His hobbies keep him very active as he travels a lot and does so much out of doors like hiking, golf, pickleball, just to name a few. And until the decline in his health, he also used to ski a lot during the winter months. And it's also important to note, and we'll get into this later, that Taraj, his rare mutation originates in Iran. Also, to make the situation worse in Canada, they do not have an orphan drug designation. This means that drugs for rare disease must go through the same process that all drugs coming into Canada go through. And this causes many challenges for patients. It takes longer to access the drugs because there's no fast tracking like in the United States that's done by the Food and Drug Administration. And thanks both of you for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, As Beth knows, I appreciate all her connections and expertise in Canada. I think it's really important and something that Beth and I continue to try and do to educate both. U.S. CF community and the Canadian CF community because we learn from one another as far as our successes and our mistakes. And Beth, I think first we'll kind of start off on the rare disease drug strategy, if you can talk about what that is before we uh, officially introduce Taraj. Absolutely. Thanks, Laura. In February 2023, Canada introduced the rare disease drug strategy which was to be a tool in policy to um, expedite access to drugs for rare diseases. Because as we've discussed before, there are a lot of challenges for patients trying to access these drugs. It's a very timely process. There's a lot of gaps with regards to labeling and people that require these drugs. So our community, the rare disease community, was very excited when this was announced. However, sadly, since 2023, I don't know of any patients. Now, it may have changed recently because BC was the first province to sign a bilateral agreement, which means that it will work conjointly with the federal government to have a program that would hopefully expedite and help access for these patients. Um, I sat in a meeting last week with the Canadian Organization for Rare Diseases and Health Canada did go over strategy. And sadly, it was still full of gaps. So despite having the strategy, there's a lot of gaps that still need to be filled. And, you know, I think Taraj is one of the patients that is falling through the gaps and it's not okay. And, you know, to have this policy rolled out and all that was $1.4 billion that was to go into the strategy. And we are very excited about it. But after learning more about it, it just seems same old, sadly. So uh, Taraj is somebody that's um, clawed. He's a, he's in a gap, and it's not okay. And we need to let everybody know about that. And I'm so glad we are. And thanks for explaining that to everyone, Beth. Taraj, first, I want to know how you're doing today. How your health is? Yeah. Um, fortunately, I've been stable, but as CF is, it's been progressing. Um, 
currently as of today, um, my FEV1 percentage is about 35%. If you go back about two years ago or three years ago, that was about 45%. So it is in a downward trajectory, as you would imagine. Uh, at this point, I'm just trying to do my best to maintain it in that 35% and above the 30% uh, to avoid going into a kind of a pre-long transplant uh, list. So extending it out as much as possible, see if there's a drug that comes out or if there's an ability to access strike after another modulators. And as we talk about in the cystic fibrosis community, if someone looked at you, it's an invisible disease. They would never guess that anything is wrong with you. You're in a suit, you look handsome, you look completely healthy, and they would never know everything that is going on with you. And now you have the possibility of transplant. You know, how are you and your family handling that? It's, it, it, it is tough. Um, but I feel like as a person with CF, somebody who kind of grew up with it since very young age, we always knew that that's a possibility that one day, or not a possibility, it's an eventuality that one day that will come. So it is shocking that I might be getting to that point that where in the next two, three years, long trans will be happening or I will be in that pre long trans win list. We are sad about it. I think my family and my girlfriend are more sad about it than I am because I've accepted that is the reality of it and that is a need to continue living. Uh, but frankly, I haven't given too much thought about what it means when I get there. At this point, I'm just fighting. I don't want to think about the transplant yet. I want to keep fighting. I want to see if I could access a drug that will help me avoid that. So it's kind of an unknown. And what are your hopes for this rare disease drug strategy that Beth was explaining. I mean, your hopes, your fears. I mean, you must have had so much hope in this. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, kind of going back three, four years before Tricafta was even approved in Canada, I was helping various CF uh, community members and advocacy groups to try to push this across. So meeting with our MPs, other members of the parliament or local BC members or MLAs to try to push this forward. But at that time, I wasn't even thinking that this drug would potentially not work for my mutation. So I've been involved the past four years of trying to push forward something that wasn't working for me till I realized that it wasn't. And it's been just unfortunate. It's been attempt after attempt after attempt of connecting with different members of parliaments, with different MLA members, connecting with Vertex to try to get access. And for me at this point is a matter of what can we do to try to get this access? A lot of other countries out there allow everybody to try it to see if, if it works and get that trial data from that six months attempt rather than waiting for Vertex or the producing company to get that trial. Because for mutations like mine, which is super rare from the Middle East, there is likely never a chance to get that trial in vitro data or in through Vertex themselves. So let's give whatever number of mutations that are left out of the most recent submission to cadets, which is 157 mutations, the opportunity to try it and see if it works. That's all I'm asking. And I think one thing to point out is, too, is your mutation is not rare in Iran. It's rare in Canada. Is that correct? I know that's been some of the problems sometimes where the mutation is not rare. It's just because you're living in Canada, maybe it's considered rare there. I know that was um, the case with two other CF moms' children's, right, Beth? So right. Vicky Malbonado, yeah. And Cambry White. Yeah. So that's a problem. So where you have not been at all able to try Trikafta, Taraj? Uh, not till this point, just because I either have to pay for it myself to get out access or try to find another avenues to do it. And unfortunately, I've just been pushing Vertex to see if we could get through a compassionate program, see if there's other ways to access it. But, uh, you know, we're just waiting. We're just trying to see what this recent submission to Cadet means. And when that comes out, does that open an avenue for me to get some sort of a compassionate access? And okay. Beth, I wanted you to talk about this too, because I know that there is an issue because of the way it's set up through Vertex, right? It's set up yeah. so that there's the compassionate care and there's the other, yeah. right? Yeah. I just wanted to know, Therese, what answers are you getting? What are the politicians saying? What is um, 
I guess, the province telling you, and what is vertexing? What are the blocks that they're putting up in front of access for you? I think it just goes in a circle. It seems like Health Canada kind of reverts back to the data from Vertex. Vertex goes back to Health Canada. So Vertex says that we don't have any data supporting that this works for your mutation. Therefore, we can't provide that. And we're very certain that Compassionate Use will not be providing that either. And then when we go to the Gulf Canada, provincial bodies, they say the same thing that, okay, well, we want to wait and see what happens with the most recent submissions and what does the company say. So it's been a complete circle of just going around both sides, kind of pointing fingers at each other saying, oh, they need to do it first or they need to provide. But I think at the end of the day, the puck stops with Vertex Mm -hmm. because I think it is in their ability to provide um, compassionate use. And I want to make sure I'm not I am understanding, and I don't want to just say they don't get it. They're a company that they have to make sure that they are keeping in line with what's the data that they have and the trials that they've done. But I just want to point to other countries that allow this. So although Vertex could provide the compassionate use, our government, Canadian government, a local government should be pushing for it as well because they could pay for it and push Vertex to probably provide that to me. So it goes around for both sides. And it must be so frustrating for you. I mean, I know how hard it is to sometimes find, oh, this drug's not covered. It doesn't even have to be a CF drug. And then it's an out of pocket is it's not possible for Trikafta. But how is your frustration level and what's your next plan or move? Uh, I am as frustrated as I can get, uh, especially when you're you're in that low 30s with FEVs. Anything can tilt at any time. I think. I am going to give it a bit more time to see what happens with the latest submission and see if there is anything we could do there uh, once that's approved and see with a handful of mutations that are left, there is a path for us to push forward to get access. Uh, and if that doesn't happen, then I got to find a way to access it and then be the trial myself and see if it works. And if it does, then provide that data to uh, and I both had, sides. I'm so sorry for interrupting you. I was no, just sure. like on the verge of this. I thought, oh my gosh. What are your thoughts and what are your doctor's thoughts? And I know this isn't the best way to do it, but desperation is a whole nother thing, right? So if you had access to Trikafta, would you try it? Could you go on it with the okay of your doctor? If it was donated to you, I'm just wondering, what are your other options legally? Um, without putting words in anyone's mouth and my doctor's mouth without really, you know, consulting with them hundred percent, I think their responsibility is the care of the patient. If any patient gets access to any drug through any means, their responsibility is to monitor and to make sure that person taking that drug is safe. So based on that understanding, I think my doctors would probably not have an issue with me going on it. And I would not have an issue going on it if I can get access to it through any means. Uh, and their job would be to follow, to see if it works, and to provide that data to the company. And I think most CF doctors in all clinics feel the same because they all want to find a way forward for their patients to get care and to get better. I'm sure that they are willing to try anything as long as the patient is willing to take the risk. And at the end of the day, it all comes down to the patient and the risk they're willing to take. Now that um, BC has actually signed the bilateral agreement for the rare disease drug strategy, And there is money there. BC, (laughs) British Columbia. Yeah, British Columbia, sorry. (laughs) Um, Have you looked at the possibility of having Trikafta funded through the rare disease drug strategy? Uh, Yes, we did. And it was kind of left out saying, we don't know yet. Um, It's tough because I've gone through Vertis, kind of gone through my private insurance. And I think... I don't want to misspeak here, but in terms of the rare disease strategy, it still reverts back that there needs to be some proof that it works. So be it through in vitro data or some sort of okay from the company. So I I think that one we have still left to fully dig into it. But I know on on the basic level, we were speaking through it through some other advocates that wasn't the path forward. But I think at this point, we're still waiting for the recent cadets to fully get approved and see how that shakes out and kind of go from there. And I think at this point, yeah, I got to just see what happens in the next couple months and 
if it doesn't try to find a pass, get access? I think that's an avenue that really needs to be looked at because, as I said, I attended the CORD meeting with Health Canada and that rare disease drug strategy is just full of holes and gaps. And this is something, and I personally think that your situation is one that needs to be an example of why these changes need to be made. Because as I see it, I think only like a couple of drugs have been approved through the rare disease drug strategy. It's not fixing any of the gaps. It's not speeding up access. So if that was an issue, it's not speeding up access because it has to go through the entire process prior to coming to that bilateral agreement. And then they have to make a decision. So I think that's a place that we really need to. And as an advocate for rare disease that I'll be really pushing for with your story, with your permission as an example, saying this is failing us. And this is an example right here. This is not a rare disease drug strategy. It's just another it's a label that doesn't address any of the issues that our patients are dealing with. So, yeah, I think it's a, p- a place we still need to push. And I'm happy to continue to work alongside and with you. Absolutely. I mean, I think being a CF patient was also trying to lead a life and work and everything. Sometimes, frankly, I'm exhausted with trying to think of days that are out there that I could approach. And I would say the CF community advocates like yourself and others have been very helpful to find ways for me to access things, access this drug, and also find paths forward. So I'm always open to ideas that we could approach this. And I also think, too, that you are, as you just said, so exhausted by the disease and then by fighting for yourself and then dealing with your insurance company and dealing with everything else. It is a lot. Oh, and do you have a full-time job? Are you working? Can you go to college, et cetera, et cetera? Do you have a family? All of that stuff is so much for one person. So we all have to fight with you. I think it's really important. Beth and I talk about this all the time, but no one should be left behind. And, you know, Emily's entourage here in the United States is working on that final 10% of all mutations that don't have a CF modulator. And I can certainly also put you in touch with her and connect you so you have more hope as well. I'll connect you with Emily. I think one of the biggest things right now is raise awareness everywhere about the situation. But just not having the ability to even try and to know, you just want to know. Yep. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You're waiting for the next modulator then, right? You're absolutely correct, Laura. It's I think at the core of it, it feels a bit inequal that we all have the same condition, the same CF, but the 10% of us that are not now approved under different mutation approval by Vertex can't access it just mm-hmm. virtually because we don't have the mutation that they say it needs to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and through all the communications that I've had with different parties, it's always been all I'm asking for is a six-month trial just to see if it works. I'm not asking you to provide it for me forever if it doesn't work because it doesn't make sense for me at that point either. Uh, Why would I want to be on a drug that doesn't work for me? Because it has side effects. It's not like Tricap that just comes out and there is no side effects. There's so many known side effects that I can then also be caused by. So if it doesn't make any improvement for me, I don't want to be on it. That's our ask. And it seems very confusing that this ask just gets ignored. Yeah. It's a life-giving drug, possibly, for you. And you are a hardworking Canadian who deserves an opportunity to trial this drug to see if it works. And like any doctor would not continue to keep, even if it, you wanted to stay on it, a doctor would not ethically keep you on a drug that wasn't benefiting you, right? So there's that too. The other thing, I was so happy to hear uh, Laura mention Emily's Entourage. I don't know if you're familiar with Emily's Entourage. Man. I would highly recommend that you um, look up Emily's Entourage she has CF and has been working diligently for the final 10%. And when Laura makes that connection, maybe there's trials that you can trial there that are specifically for the 10%. Like, I don't know how that would work, but, you know, it's a connection and it's a step forward to something that we will continue to work towards Trikafta. But, you know, if there's other options with drugs or therapies that might benefit your final 10%, then um, Laura, that was a great great suggestion. 
And she has a lot going on. Um, it's all research. It's all for the 10%. She's going to be the one who figures it out. I'm 100% certain she is. And I will definitely connect you as soon as we're done here. But I also know that she's also doing a new program, which we're all going to help promote. And I have to get that information. I don't have that in front of me. So Emily Kramer Golenkoff, she continues to do things that are going to help the final 10%. I also wanted to say, you know, there is like this step therapy in the United States where they'll tell a patient, you've got to try this, quote, cheaper medication first and fail on it before we'll let you go to a more expensive one. And as Beth said, as we were talking There are medications we've all been on that we find don't work for us or we have, you know, some kind of reaction to, but no one is being banned or barred from trying them. And I know it's different because these are mutations, but I agree it isn't a foolproof way to make a blanket statement, right, that says, well, this couldn't possibly impact your mutation. So where do you both think that we go from here? Well, I can start with um, outside of the rare disease drug strategy, which was implemented but isn't being widely used or accepted at this point and has full of gaps. That's what I think of the rare disease drug strategy currently. When I see people and patients like Taraj um, struggling, and I thought that was going to support them, Uh, We are also working on a rare disease strategy, which is all-encompassing therapies, um, diagnostics for rare diseases, because often, you know, people aren't diagnosed with a rare disease. It sometimes takes 10 years average, I believe, to be diagnosed, Um, clinics and specialists and that. So we're working on having a rare disease strategy in Canada, a national strategy. If the provinces and federal government aren't going to work nicely together, then perhaps it has to be a federal program so that everyone, because right now there's no difference in our, what we call the postal code lottery. If only one province has signed on in a year and a half, only one province has signed on to the rare disease drug strategy. So we need to do better. And, um, you know, Maddie and I, along with the rest of the rare disease community are working really hard and trying to make as much noise as we can to make that change for patients with CF, rare patients with CF, and all rare disease patients. And of course, we'll continue to try and work for patients like Taraj who deserve the opportunity to try. That's all we're asking. It's all he's asking, and he deserves that. So, you know, that's part of what we're working to do. And Taraj, this is your future. I mean, this is your life. What do you want to see? What are you hoping for? It's it's unfortunate because I feel like I've tried so hard and I feel exhausted by having to try more. But I think this year, kind of following on what Beth mentioned, is maybe trying to go through that rare disease strategy path and see if there's a way to get access that way. And if all that fails, honestly, at this stage, it's a matter of taking things into my own hands and trying to see if there is other path of getting access to the drug. Um, purchasing it myself or trying to find donations, all the other paths to just get that couple months of access to see if it works for me. And at the end of the day, I am in Canada and we have free healthcare. So I've always tried to explain it to the different bodies, the government bodies, that the cost for a CF patient to continue getting admitted to the hospital two to three times for two weeks of antibiotics or the cost of even going through transplants the post-care of a transplant and all that many years of whatever you have to do, whatever the government and the healthcare system has to do to keep the patient healthy, those costs outweigh whatever it is to get access for six months. I think in Canada, track after costs somewhere in that $25,000 per month. So if you do it multiple by six, that's about $150,000. $150,000 to save millions, potentially, it's a number that the government body shouldn't care about. Unfortunately, they still stuck on that. So my hope is find one path one way or another. And uh, I don't have a direct knowledge of what I'm going to do at this point, but I'm just hoping that the government comes around or I can find the path through the the rare disease strategy for now. If not, I'll take things to my own hand. 
the numbers game. The numbers game really frustrates me. And, and I think it's really heartbreaking that you or any other patient has to break your life and your value of your life down to number. Like I'm always want to cry right now, Taraj, because you are more than a number. You are worth more. We should not have to define our lives and our quality of life by justifying that we're not going to cost the government as much. You're more than that. Your quality of life is more important than that. And please know that we are going to continue to work alongside you. And it's the numbers matter, but not nearly as much as the quality of your life and you being here. So I'm sorry that I had to interject that because I know my daughter, we did the same thing, tried to justify. Like, I don't think we should have to justify the value that we bring to the world every day with numbers. Right. You are a hardworking, contributing person of society that has a family and friends that love you. And the money can always be sorted out. We can't get another you. So sorry, Laura, this is one of my big pet peeves. And and oh. please know that Laura and I, along with all the other people that are working with you, will work with you to do what we can. OK, I'm out. And no, no, I no. That is exactly that. exactly what we were on the same exact same page. And I was going to say, you know, in the United States, it's the same thing, too. You try and reason with them. If you're talking about money, if you were going to take this from a non-emotional point of view and it's just economic, it makes more sense to get somebody the drug that is going to help them. But here it's so convoluted and you know, you want to work with the insurance company and pharma and you want to make it all work. But if the insurance company won't even put your drug on the formulary, you can't even get access to it here. And I'm not talking in this instance about Trikafta, but if there is a drug not on the formulary, you have to do exactly the exasperating, almost humiliating thing that Beth was just saying. You have to say, well, Financially, this is how it will help you because the person will stay out of the hospital and it is demeaning and it is wrong and you shouldn't have to qualify your right to live because you need this drug. It is so frustrating. And, you know, as parents, Beth and I can fight for Maddie and for my girls, Molly and Emily, and your parents can fight for you, Taraj. But as the person who has it, it's PTSD. It's PTSD for the parents, but it's so much to have to try and handle and negotiate and talk about and discuss. We all know and are in agreement on how frustrating and how wrong this is. Yeah, I think we have a lot to change. And I have to say, even here in Michigan, so the Rare Disease Advisory Council in the United States it was in 27 states. I've kind of lost track and it's taken years and Michigan still hasn't passed it. And all it is, is a council that has no legal authority, but will give advice to lawmakers and say, here's why step therapy or whatever doesn't work if you're going to vote on this. And it includes insurance people, pharma, doctors, geneticists, nurses, parents and patients. And it's taken years and it's bipartisan. So we have to demand that everybody has to step up because you're at 35% FEV. There just isn't a lot of time to mess around, right? There so is. I think we just need to get even more mad than we are and demand action. And I have been on my little soapbox here, but we just got to keep moving forward for people like you. And we will. And the unfortunate part is I'm a finance guy, so I always try to grapple with the numbers, but you're absolutely right. My health is not about the numbers, but that's how I try to justify. I say, okay, does this make sense or does this not make sense? And in all ends, it makes sense number-wise or equality-wise. And the last thing I want to kind of put out there is I'm not sure if Vertex would ever have the opportunity to do a trial clinic on somebody with my mutation. Just because it's such a rare mutation from Middle East, which doesn't even have a lot of CF cases to start with. So unless I can get the chance to try this, we will never, ever know that it works for me otherwise. And that's what I've been trying to tell them and tell different parties. But it just it's just frustrating that this goes over everyone's heads. And they're like, oh, yeah, well, there's no trial clinic. for it. How would there be a trial clinic? Yeah. Oh, sorry, a clinical trial for it. If my mutation is so rare that you will never, ever have the access to try it on. 
And I do have to say, too, a statement from Vertex is in show notes. They are a sponsor of this podcast. We have a good relationship. We all have a good relationship. And again, Beth and I always talk. Pharma's not the enemy. We need them. We need Tricaptal. We need research to continue. So it is something all of us need to make work with the insurance companies, with the doctors, because we're all after the same thing to make a difference in the CF community for everybody's life. And it can only get better. It has to get better. It's a fulsome approach. And, and you were absolutely right. And I mentioned that earlier on. I'm not pointing fingers just at Vertex because I understand they have their own processes to follow through. But it's about Vertex, our local government, our federal government, all working together to find a path forward. And at this point, just like how other countries have done this, the path forward would be to provide access one way or another. Right. And we can call people out. We can call Vertex out and, and still love and respect them. We can call each other out. Anybody can call me out on anything. I think that's the way the world should work. Hey, Laura, you know, you need to do this different, or I think you messed up here. I want to know. Well, we can push. All the stakeholders need to be pushed. I'm so tired of them pulling and working against each other, right? There, It's mm-hmm. always like the government or the insurance companies against pharma instead of working together for the patient. All the stakeholders have to recognize in the center is a patient. And if they would get away from all of this antagonistic behaviors and combat and put the patients in the center and say, how can we most effectively get the most patients access to these medications? If pharma can create a drug with three pills a day that can correct the defective gene in your body, I think there's some minds that should be able to figure this whole mess out so that we can get the drugs to the patients that need them in a quick manner, right? In a quick and safe manner. That's what we need is collaboration by everybody with the patients in the center. Like, Taraj matters. Let's see how we can work together to let him trial. It's not asking a lot. So well said. And oh my gosh, it's not asking anything. It's not asking. It's save a life. This is a life, you know, and it matters. Every person's life matters. We're here with you, Taraj. We are resources for you and we are fighting with you. So thank you. Reach out to us. Yeah, I think the CF community is probably one of the most kindest and helpful community out there. I've never seen so many hands being reached out from people who barely know you. I've never met you in person to say, hey, we feel you. We believe in you to have access and to keep living uh, with this condition. And I've always been helpful, uh, hopeful that there will be something out there. It's kind of sad because my parents always raised me thinking that I'm normal, don't have any conditions. But of course, as you get older, disease progresses. But they've always said, hey, one day you'll have access to something that will fix the problem. And Trikafta has done that for so many people. So I believe that if it's Trikafta that will help me, or given the chance I could try it, maybe there's that option there. Maybe there's other things that I could try, but I just want to continue living. I just want to continue uh, having the ability to not be uncertain about the future, but thinking that if I'm proposing to my girlfriend, I could be there for the next 30, 40 years to be with her, that I can be there for my parents when they're, they age, that I can think about having a family one day. All of those things are not possible if there is uncertainty. And this right now is one path to certainty for me. So I really hope that I can get that access to the later. Yes, and you deserve that future. And yeah. your parents deserve to see it as well. Do you have siblings also? Does anyone else in the family have cystic fibrosis? I have a one brother, but uh, he is, he's a carrier, but he doesn't have CF. But still there's like in the United States, I believe it's 10 million carriers. So it impacts potentially a lot of people. So people should be paying attention to this. And Beth, what would you like to say to close this out after Taraj so beautifully said so many wonderful things. Well, I just want to let Taraj know. First, I want to say thank you to you, Laura, for allowing us the opportunity to once again share the struggles that we're dealing with here in Canada. I know that the U.S. has their struggles as well. So thank you for sharing our stories and Taraj's story. But I want to let Taraj know that um, 
there is a community that surrounds him and will hold him up and that we will do whatever we can to let him get the trial, get the access if possible. I'm hoping that he does reach out to Emily's entourage because I think that's a great resource for him. But I know you won't, but just never give up and know that there's a lot of people holding you up and holding you in our hearts and prayers, Taraj. So keep in touch and let's get this done. Thank you both. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate this opportunity, Laura, to share my story. Well, thank you. And we are going to put all the information in our show notes. It is in the show notes if people want to reach out and help you or have other ideas. And of course, as soon as we're done here, I will connect you with Emily. But I think it's really important that Beth and I continue to raise awareness about what's going on in Canada and the U.S. because we're all in this together so that we can continue to help each other. So, Taraj, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you. Well done. Thank you, Taraj. The original music in this podcast is performed by Kevin Allen. It's not complicated. Who happens to have cystic fibrosis. We all got our worries and fears. I know what's got you frustrated. But loving you is so all right. This has been the Living with Cystic Fibrosis podcast. For more information and to learn more about the Bonnell Foundation, visit our website at thebonnellfoundation.org. That's the B-O-N-N-E-L-L foundation.org. This podcast was produced by Jag and Detroit Podcasts. Follow our show on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you're listening right now.